Okay, people. So I have got with me today Bronwyn. Bronwyn? Oh, I've got to correct you on that one. I've had many, oh. many pronunciations of my name. That's got to be the worst one ever, Kevin. Oh, um, <laughs> the, the, as, as in, well, my first name is John because my, my parents, when I was christened, um, thought that Berwin was, was a difficult name. It was quite a hard name to give a little beautiful baby. So they added John, but, um, but I'm called Berwin. Um, only, I think the best way to think about it is Bear and a win at the end. Berwin or Berwin, if you wanted to roll your eyes okay berwin rollins perfect <laughs> oh man thank you for uh, giving me your time i really appreciate that because i realize you're a little bit busy right now so um yeah thank you no no thank you as in um i i love to talk and i i specifically love to talk about iris and and more specifically all the wonderful films and filmmakers that we are fortunate to have a relationship with so. yeah so that's you know what i mean that's how you came to my attention because I, I i started to see the iris stuff and um you're showing stuff on channel four which is huge but before i think let's go back a little bit so what is iris like it's a film festival but you know what i mean what's the kind of origins of the whole situation yeah well iris um in its simplest forms you've, you've hit it on the head you know it most people would know iris um because it has a it's a film festival but um we also have a prize which is the iris prize and the iris prize is called continues to be the world's largest prize for uh, an lgbt short film um I say LGBT as if everybody should know what that is, but um, LGBT is um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and we've added a plus, um, but we've got lots of other letters I'm sure we could add to the LGBT plus. And, um, and yeah, it's, you know, what, what I've said to most people about Iris is that Iris is a film festival and a media organization first, and we've decided to focus and celebrate LGBT stories and um, sounds a little bit like splitting hairs at the beginning of a conversation, but I think it's important, you know, we're not um, a campaigning organization, mm -hmm. All, although we are very successful in changing minds or helping the debate um, move forward about, you know, diversity um, and, and with intersectionality, diversity across the board by sharing stories, but um, you could call it soft diplomacy, but um, I wouldn't even go that far. I would say it's just plain and simple. Um, it's about sharing stories and we want, as an organization, our aim is really, really straightforward and simple. We want more people to experience, um, enjoy, and uh, you know, see um see lgbt stories so that that's what we're trying to do yeah well I, I think the more you share stories the more people experience different different cultures different lives different ways of living which then is the behavioral change right because i think a lot of the animosity a lot of the, the divide is people not knowing you know they might have been told Oh, you know what I mean? Gay people are evil. They take your soul. You know what I mean? Just crazy shit like that, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. just like, mm -hmm. well, you know, you, you hang around with someone, and then one day they 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 might come out and be like, hey, just so you know, I'm, I'm gay. And you're like, huh, my soul is intact. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and it's just like, it's, it's, no one's different. Everyone is the same but just have different preferences. And that's the yeah. thing I think a lot of people miss and don't understand. So even though, as you said, you, you don't necessarily campaign, but sharing the stories, that's the campaign in itself. Well, I'm, I'm 55 and, um, and I came out, I guess, as a gay man 
where and, and I mean came up I, I was happy about my sexuality probably by the time I was 19 and and there was a period before where you know and we're talking about a fairly gruesome period where you know you, you know all you could hear in the media was you were going to die of AIDS um, there, there was an inevitability about that and then of course a few years later the Satcher government the Tory government at, at the time um, you know introduced clause or section 28 uh, clause 28 and um, and meant that you know every local authority in the United Kingdom were not allowed to even suggest that being gay or having a gay lifestyle was normal and and it sort of had a ginormous effect. Um, so I, I I was sort of coming out and dealing with my sexuality at that point, and I and I can remember a couple of things really. I can remember seeing two men kiss for the first time, and uh, I hadn't seen it. You know, it didn't exist. Um, Channel Four, which is interesting, we could talk about Channel Four later and, and the importance of of that amazing channel. But you know, they had their little pink triangle that appeared on the top corner of the screen late at night, which is to indicate we're going to show some gay stuff. Be prepared, you know. <laughs> and um, and it was quite shocking. Um, and I wasn't sure if I was sexually turned on by it or whether I was horrified by what I was seeing. So I'm quite, I can still, therefore, the point I'm making um, is I can still remember seeing things for the first time and realizing the impact that had. So, you know, today it's very difficult to challenge that, you know, Berwin, the gay person in 2021, um, as we look, stare 2022 um, in the face, you know, that we are in a better position as um, gay people, LGBT people. We could get married, civil partnered, adopt children, we've got employment rights. Um, if you like soap operas, it looks as if every soap opera needs at least a, f a sprinkling of lesbians or gays. You know, the situation, the situation is much, much, much better. However, you know, if you accept, you know, ten percent or whatever um, of the population might identify as LGBT, we're still only sort of skirting over visibility. So, you know, things are getting better, but. When you see uh, a police officer, when you see uh, a detective on a television series, the assumption is always that they are straight. Um, and the reality is, if they're not straight, there is some ginormous story on the, on the line, you know, which, which involves coming out or a big secret. Um, so we've got a long way to go to normalize, you know, the, the, the diversity of stories. You know, because I think some people, you know, still think that gay people or gay men in particular don't grow old. They think that, you know, the gay person is basically mid-twenties with a 20-inch waistline and they dance and take drugs every weekend, you know. Well, I mean, haven't they met Ian McKellen? You know what I mean? <laughs> they, 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 that's a great example of, of a yeah. guy that's just been killing it yeah. for all these years. And but you know, but the reality, but the reality is, what we even with someone like Ian McKellen, and of course the wonderful ITV, um, I guess you'd call it a sitcom, Vicious, which does paint an interesting, um, an interesting um, look at uh, a, a, an aged gay couple um, from a, a theatre background, but um, or, a, or a thespian background. Um, but no, the reality is, you know. As I said earlier, the, the majority of stories that we see um, are sort of guided from a certain direction, and um, and that's why Iris continues to be important in that it does shine a light um, on you know um, on the lives of gay people um, and not necessarily from oh dear it's another coming out film you know um, don't get me wrong coming out films are important and each generation will need their coming out films. And of course it changes. You know, I was born in 1966 and technically until 1967, that little baby, um, if the law didn't change, was going to grow up as a citizen who would be practicing something which was deemed illegal. Mm. Um, when I did come out, my partner at the time was a year younger 
Um, but Tammy, you know, but it wasn't 21. So that was technically illegal. Well, today, of course, you know, the age of consent is the same across the board. So the situation is changing and changing every every single year. Um, so there's a lot to be grateful for living in the West in particular. But what's interesting about Iris, of course, is the international dimension. It is, you know, there's two prizes, two main prizes. There's the British films, which we can talk about later, which will which are appearing shortly on Channel 4 and all four. But there's also the world's largest short film prize, which is the Iris Prize, where we have, you know, 25 nominating partners located in 20 countries. Oh. And that's an eye-opener where you see the difference, um, you know, all the different life um, opportunities to be had on this planet of ours. And I guess without being too controversial, some of the more interesting stories don't actually make it onto film. Mm. You, know, you, can look, you can look at the globe and you can see, oh, there haven't, haven't had many submissions from that part of the world. And then you realize it's one of the 70-odd countries where um, if you were to confirm that you were gay or identified as gay, you, um, if you were lucky, you'd be arrested and put in prison. If you were very unlucky, your life could be terminated there and then. So it's um, you know, the international picture is a, is a difficult one um, and, and and a varied one. Um, but I love it. You know, the whole stories that are coming out and just comparing being gay in South America versus being gay in a Scandinavian country or whatever. The diversity of stories is is, is wonderful. Yeah, the other year. Um... I had the pleasure of speaking with, uh, oh gosh, let me, Pete Mur Murmi. He was the um, the director of I Am Samuel, um, a Kenyan film. And he, he was like, yeah, he, he was getting, you know, there was fear of being attacked while making it. You know, I think um, you, you can get arrested in, Ken in Kenya if you're gay. And um, I think the film's banned there. Yeah. You know, and, and it was such an interesting conversation. But you, you, you know, I mean, you see just this, you know, what I mean, just the difficulty. And it's just like, oh, why is it like this? When we look back in history, sexuality was just whatever. You know, what I mean, you look at the Romans, the Greeks, everyone was just having fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just, and it's funny, it got to a point where then suddenly, no, 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 that's illegal. Ooh, you should not do that. Mm. And it's just like, what, what happened? Right? What, yeah. Where was the moment where suddenly it's like, <gasps> no, only this form of sex is good sex. And it's just yeah. like, it's so weird. Well, no, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through a history lesson because um, I haven't actually got enough history to share. But um, but it is interesting just looking at, you know, if, if you're looking at the, the Commonwealth countries that we have a relationship with, whether it's a good or a bad one. Um, and, you know, today, a, a, a large number of the 70 countries where it's illegal to identify as LGBT, um, they're Commonwealth countries. Mm. And the link that's still, still that, that is still there. So I think we should, we should be acting on that rather quickly to improve the situation for LGBT people. Um, but then I always wonder about the United Kingdom. You know, you had the Wolfenden report, which is what was that um, fifty six or fifty something, um, ten years before anything happened with the decriminalisation, well, the partial decriminalisation. But that was fifty six. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, well, what happened during the war and what happened before the war and what happened in the 18-whatever? Mm. And clearly, um, society did find a way of dealing with diversity, either by turning a blind eye or, you know, acknowledging in their small communities that, that everybody had a role to play. And because um, I'm, you know, I, I must be honest, my... Um, my view of history, because of the lack of documented history, I guess, is painted in a rose-tinted glasses to begin with. And I, I, I like to think 
that society at whatever point it was um you know were, were, were able to deal with nice people and a nice person was a nice person regardless of whether they you know found you know, whether they were gay or not mm. I don't know. Um, I probably need the, um, the TARDIS behind me to do some time traveling and, um, and to see what the situation was like for gay people in 1760 or something like that. <laughs> well, I mean, if we were to believe Homer, right, one of the biggest heroes of the time, Achilles, he had a, he had a boyfriend. Yeah. You know, so, it, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's an odd situation. It's an odd situation. But let me ask you this. Right, because in big film festivals like you know the the BFI London Film Festival, which you know just had its sixty fifth year, we do get films that you know have gay characters or <laughs> gay centric stories, right? And so, if you get that in a major film festival, that what do you think? then separates and gives the need for a you know a predominant film festival um you you've asked a, a very interesting question that sounds unbelievably patronizing why would you not no, no, ask no. a very why would you not ask a very interesting question i think i think the bigger question though um is you know is where exactly are we today vis-a-vis -vis content because yeah. I can remember, you know, content and access to stories via films was heavily controlled by the lack of TV channels, um, the fact that you had to go to the cinema mm. and, the, the, and the films were classified. So if you were of a certain age, you wouldn't get to see the films. And then, of course, the democratization that's happened over the past 40 years. Um, democratization meaning, of course, video cassettes, still heavily regulated in the United Kingdom. But then you had DVDs, then you had Blu-rays, and of course the big sort of gear change has been um, digital downloads and the, the duality of better broadband and more content through online. And of course today, you know, um, and, and we have to consider this as Iris the Film Festival, today of course our potential audience can access uh, an awful lot of content through things like Netflix. If you go there, there's a whole section of LGBT content. Um, even some of the more mainstream digital channels this year, for example, are releasing four or five Christmas movies which are LGBT or targeting the LGBT community. I've already mentioned soap operas, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so, yeah, at the moment, um, there is a big... Um, debate about the role of a film festival and what can it do. And then internally, as your question suggested, the relationship between um, what would be called a mainstream festival, which is what the term that people still use, and a niche festival like um, Iris. The reason we still need Iris today um, is that Iris is also a very safe space for LGBT people. Now then, we're very different. Having said that, we're very different to a lot of queer film festivals in that 30% um, of our audience identifies, uh, identifies as straight, i.e. they're not LGBT exclusively. And that's important because what we've tried to do is emphasize um, film uh, and LGBT stories as a film industry. As a So we have... Um, we have a strong um, emphasis on developing new talents. So we're not like um, most film festivals. We um, celebrate what's on the big screen and we do that. But that's changing. We can come to that in a minute because obviously we've taken Iris online as well. And we've got the relationship with Channel 4. We had a relationship with the BBC in Wales before that. So we've not been one of those organizations saying you must go to the cinema although as a although as a 55 year old that's the most normal thing you can do but that's a generational thing which is changing dramatically <laughs> and the pandemic of course has shone a light on it you know yes. <clears throat> it's shone a light on the elephant in the room which is um the all the things you can do at home but we've um 
But we, we as a film festival, have always been different because we celebrate, as I said, stories on the big screen, but we also have been investing in new content. So somebody actually makes a new film with Iris every year. And, um, and some, some years we've been doing um, regional films. Um, and we've got a massive announcement taking place on the 17th of January, which will further um, enhance our reputation for investing in content and the creation of content, as well as celebrating moving image on, on, on the screen. So there's the duality. So that's one thing for Iris. But no, I think you're totally right in that um, there's probably some point in the future where we would hope that there's no need for there to be an Iris LGBT film festival. You know, the day where the public can access LGBT content um, in a form which is free and available wherever, um, we will have achieved our objectives, I guess. Um, I don't know how the liberalization of the distribution of content is going to go. Because, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, you will still need, in the middle of all that content, where you're potentially, you know, we've all been there. You're sitting there and you've got access to something like 2,000 individual films. And you turn to your partner and you say, oh, I, 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 there's nothing I want to see tonight. Yeah. And you're thinking, what, well, out of 2,000? But, but then again, you'll say, oh, I'm not sure what to do. And I'm not going to say all four because of the sponsorship. But you might say, but I like the stuff that's on all four. Let's have a look and see what's there. So there will always be a need, I think, for marketing to be able to rely on a curated experience and that the brand will, you know, whether it's Flight Fest, which um, guides you in a certain direction, yeah. you yeah. know, or whether it's Iris. Um, so, um, no, I think, I think to answer your question, um, there's, you know, there is some competition, um, but I think the, the, the answer is probably, the answer is probably in, 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 in the question itself, you know, LFF, London Film Festival, is mainstream, and Iris isn't. So you're more yeah. likely, and, and simply with flair, if you look at the BFI's LGBT offering, you know, I, I am, as, a, as, as somebody who's LGBT, I'm thinking to myself, where might I find the more um, challenging or the more risque LGBT stories? And whether I'm right or wrong, my head is telling me to go to Flair, and I'm more likely to see stuff which might um, might sort of uh, excite me more than something at the LFF. I, th I think that's a fair. I, th I, th I think that's fair. Um, the, you know, the the Flair this year was fantastic. Oh man, I I saw so many just incredible films at Flair. Um, what did I see at Flair? Some of my, the stand the standout films for me at Flair this year were um, do 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 oh gosh uh, Sublet was extremely good, you know Jump Darling, The Greenhouse was oh my days The Greenhouse was fantastic, My First Summer, oh man. And and sweetheart and cowboy, those films just fucked me up, man. It was just that like you got to the end, you're like, I just want them to be happy. Like, what's going on? Like, let them be together. And it was so good. And this is this is the big thing, right? As you were talking earlier, and you said about coming out stories. And the thing I thought was so good about those stories, it wasn't. I, I just want to tell everyone, like, it was a known thing within those families, within the situations. It wasn't, that wasn't a big thing. It's like, you know what I mean? Um, it might seem like a weird analogy, but the, the most recent Spider-Man reboot, right? And on all the other ones, we've had the origin story, Uncle Ben, he gets killed, blah, blah, blah. This one didn't do it. This one, it, it did it very quickly like that in a flashback, but that was it. And it was a brand new story. And mm -hmm. that made it even more enjoyable. 
Like, not that a coming out story isn't valid, but we've just seen it so often. Yeah. And there's so many other things, right? Because they, they uh, sometimes you see, the thing is about the coming out, right? And then, so it's, it's like, so is that the only issue gay people have? Yeah. Coming out? You know, <clears throat> and, it's, and it's just like, so it negates everything else. It negates the rest of the life, the other struggles that might be there, the other situations, and just the the other the similarities to a other you know other relationships, hetero relationships, yeah. whatever, whatever. And so it's nice to see some of these stories that focus in on other situations, right? And then there were the short stories, which kind of plays into um, what you're doing. Uh, with the Channel 4 situation, because I didn't have a whole lot of time, but I was able to see Love is a Hand Grenade from Jessica um, Benahum, which was incredible. I just loved that story so damn much. And what she brought out of her cast, oh, man, it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, you had um, the... The color, the, the cost of living, which was great from Alice Truman. And what is playing on Channel 4 as part of Iris from A to Q from the incredible Emily El Fadi, who is just the film was great and, and she's such a lovely person. And, and yeah, like all of those stories, so different but so powerful in the storytelling and how they were put together. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, it was, as I say, it was such an enjoyable um, flair festival, you know? Oh, and I have to, I can't, Jonathan Wazowski's, um, he had a film, oh, the name has just slipped my mind, but it was such a great film about kids just leaving school and that, that next step, to, to university and it was just uh yeah they had a big party a, a, a who done it party and it was just oh man it was such a great film i'm so embarrassed i can't remember the name of it but yeah the, oh the, wait, wait 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 until you've been running iris for 15 years <laughs> and they um uh, much much to the horror of people linked to the festival i i listen i, I forget my own name sometimes so um i wouldn't be worried too much <laughs> but uh yeah, like I think that's that's how kind of Iris popped onto my radar as well because I saw um, Emily like talking about this great opportunity she's got on Channel Four through Iris, and I was like, "Well, it's um, we, we're we're calling it in house the gift that keeps giving," and um, again, you, you know, you alluded to or you challenged a little bit about. You know the relationship between the LFF, London Film Festival, and IUS. Um, but I think the conversation is broader than that, and it's what you do. So for us, as an organisation, you know, I, I said film festival and media organisation. So we have a relationship with the filmmakers throughout the year, yeah. and our partnership with Channel Four and the family of brands which flow from that, um, specifically All Four um, as the platform for us. You know, it means that, you know, we get to meet the filmmakers in the run-up to Iris. We then celebrate with them for this, almost a week of Iris. Then we have winners and highly commended. But we continue the relationship with the 15 when, obviously, they get this year, um, which is the second year of the partnership, they get to be premiered on terrestrial television. Um, and that's very important for any filmmaker as a, as a, as a career defining moment you know when you know, have you had anything broadcast well actually i have and this is the date we then of course make sure that the films are available for a whole 12 months and people can dip in and out when they want to when they've got the time and um and then we kind of have a graduation we um we work with um partners down in um brighton um at the brighton fringe festival so we have a, a little sort of um graduation Thank you very much. And then we prepare for the next batch of, of filmmakers. While all that is happening, we've also got something called Iris on the Move, where we take 
more than just the British films, which you can enjoy on all four, but we take some of the winning films from the main um, Irish Prize competition, and we're visiting Newcastle, Manchester, Liverpool, um, Plymouth, Bournemouth, Brighton, and um, and there we're going to be introducing um, some of the audiences to the filmmakers, um, and that's another thing that a film festival can do. Mm. That obviously an online festival can only do partly because yeah. obviously you know if we were live at iris today you know we would be sitting on a stage and people could come to kevin and talk to you afterwards about what you're doing etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are elements of that but no the um the, there are elements of you know our relationship with the filmmakers that um that that's that's ongoing and um and that's why you know what we're able to do with channel four and film four is is so amazing again we have another announcement to be made next year which is very exciting as well in in that um i can go into the details of it um but it will involve making sure that even more people get to see the british films so um so as i said you know we, we I think it'd be very difficult to sit back and say, this is what we do. Um, you've constantly got to be looking at two things, really. The, the filmmakers, um, but we spend just as much time thinking about the audience. And I, think, and I think sometimes we forget about the audience. We think, oh, yeah, stick them on the website, stick them on YouTube, and everybody will find them. You know? And there's a lot of content on YouTube. And um, so you've got, to, you've got to find different ways of making sure that people can find stuff. Um, so for us, it's not building the Iris brand. Um, A, we haven't got the resources to do what Coca-Cola could do, but we have hopefully got a savvy nature in, in who we should be partnering up with. So I'll give you an example. I um, After Iris this year, we reintroduced the in-person festival. And we also carried on presenting the online offering. And, uh, I, I, and I was quite numb after the festival. I, and I, I wasn't quite sure what we'd achieved because you were so tired. And I, I know that sounds unbelievably sad and a bit pathetic because um, everybody else, I think, has had 18 months of, 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 of a weirdness. But I, I managed to find my way up to Aesthetica. So if anybody's never been to Aesthetica in York, it's a short film festival. It's the most amazing. I mean, we've been a guest programmer there for five years. So I had some time out and I met different people. And um, and I and sort of I realized that we're not doing badly, actually. But what I did find, the thing that made me sort of feel slightly better about everything, there was nobody at the festival who didn't know about Iris. And one of the key um, mechanisms where they knew about Iris was, oh, we've seen your stuff on all four. Mm. And it's amazing. So coming back to that, um, it, as I said, it's the gift that keeps giving. And um, I'm just hoping that in the same way that, that the partnership has been really good to Iris, I'm hoping it's been even better for the filmmakers. Um, and of course, um, um, an opportunity for people over 12 months to dip in and see some weird and wonderful um, stories about the LGBT experience. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the thing, right? It is creating that ecosystem that builds and sustains itself, but touches so many different things. and. Uh, and I get it, right? At the end of the festival, you're tired, right? I've organized huge events, and at the end of it, you're just like, okay. All right? yeah. I don't know what happened. I don't know if people enjoyed it. I, I have no clue. And it's not until later on, like a week later or something like that, and then people be like, oh, man, that was great. Or, yeah. oh, man, I remember that thing from the thing. And you're like, wait, you... You went? Oh, you heard that? You, huh. And then it starts to sink in what actually happened. 
But yeah. Um, yeah, it's just one of those crazy things about you know, <laughs> living that sort of life, right? <laughs> well, I, I, I think what was specific about this year, because normally it doesn't happen, I'm kind of, it's like on to the next project, you know, and you're full of energy and full of beans. I think the issue for me was um, the online offering a year ago was successful. Yeah. Um, and we we embraced it completely. And we had good numbers, but we enjoyed the experience and we produced a lot of original content ourselves. So we were doing a half hour, what I would call a TV magazine program to help people contextualize what we were sharing during the week. So to do that and then to bring the festival back in person, I think that was a difficult thing because we had a pile, we had a list of reasons why we shouldn't do it. But that was equal to a list of reasons why we should do it. So we knew we knew that we weren't going to be able to deliver what the audience had come for, become familiar with. So for, for example, um, all 35 of the filmmakers, international filmmakers, were competing for the main prize. They were told not to come to the festival. They were told that you know we were abiding by Welsh government's um, guidance and that international travel was not seen as, as a clever thing to do. And um, so we knew that they were not going to be with us. And they, they play a very important part because, you know, the 35, most of them turn up, which is great. Most of them come with a partner or a friend or a business associate. So that doubles the number. Most of them will stay with somebody local who hosts them for the period of the festival. It's one of the things we offer. That's nice. So that doubles the numbers up again. So you know, you knew there was about you know potentially two hundred people who wouldn't be coming in and out. Mm. Uh, that you'd lost that, and there were some other things. But no, um, but in the end, um, what we what we were able to do was organise some big standout events, and people came out. I mean, we could have you know they could have been bigger and bigger and bigger. So opening night award show, we did a gig with Heights and um, we did a few of the biggie things. So we, you know, we definitely didn't want 2021 to be the, um, the in-between festival. Is it a big one? Is it open? Is it in person? So we wanted yeah. people to have memorable experiences. Unfortunately though, and I'm, I'm being honest here, and this is replicated from what I know with talking to partners in cinemas, people generally were not coming out to see a film. Yeah. The, the numbers were quite low. If they thought it was a special event and there was added value and something special happening, oh, my God, try keeping them away. And they were there, and it was joyous and wonderful. It was teary. It was, oh, my God, I can't believe there were 300 people in it, blah, 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 all of that. But going out just to see some films... So I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm minded that our friends in the cinema sector and that's obviously in a replicated with theatre, I think they've got quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of catching up to do and, and, and the public um, hopefully will rediscover the joys of going to the cinema because, you know, there's a lot of competition and I'm just hoping that the pandemic um, hasn't been, and I don't think it has, um, but I hope it definitely hasn't been another nail in the coffin of cinema, because um, that would be very sad. I mean, to be honest with you, Bowen, I kind of think the pandemic might be the wake-up call the cinema needs, you know, because the cinema, it, it kind of got complacent, right? And the situation you see the distributors and the cinema are in, it didn't have to be like that because about, I would say, a decade ago, it might have been slightly longer, it might have been slightly less. There was talk about all the major studios coming together and creating an online platform, right? So they could screen films. But people were arguing about oh, what share they were getting. You know, there was a there was a concern of private. I can't speak, man. Privacy, <laughs> right? So they that that was a fear. But I think the biggest thing was, oh wait, if, if all these films were on this, but 
our films are bigger than your films, so we should get more money. And there was all of this, so it never happened. It never happened, right? Again, when you look at cinemas, like, but the um, the Curzon have got Curzon at home, but no other cinema chain has got, like, BFI has got the BFI player, yeah. but the BFI isn't a cinema as such. But the Curzon is the only cinema brand I can think of that had the Curzon at home. Right, so you how big the Odeon is, Cineworld view. They could have all had that situation, yeah. but they didn't, and they just thought because you go into a cinema and a bag of M and M's, which you might buy in your local <laughs> news agent Sainsbury's at seventy p. Cinema is charging you one seventy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they they put over a hundred pound markup on it. The price of tickets went up crazy because yeah. it used to. I remember as a kid, I go to the cinema with five pounds. That's a ticket. That's the train fare. And that was a happy meal in McDonald's <laughs> for five pounds. Yeah. Now it's like if you're if you're going on a date, you're go you're taking someone along with you, you're dropping 30 at least. Yeah. Yeah. And so the cinema, it, it, it felt like it got a little complacent. It and it started to price itself out. So the moment, right, when things get to a certain point on price, the moment something like a barrier comes up, it's just like, eh, don't yeah. need it, right? And that was a problem with the cinema. And plus, I think, because I went, I, I went, um, I, I went to see Tenant and the, the the London Film Festival in 2020, there were some live screenings. So I saw one night in so one night in um, uh, Manhattan. What? I don't think it was Manhattan. The one with uh, but it, oh my days, my memory is rubbish. But it was the the, the film with um, Malcolm X um, uh, and all in man's habit, like hanging out and doing that. But I, I saw that. I saw Soul. And I saw um, a great film with Stanley Tucci and uh, Colin Firth, Supernova. Yes, and and that was mm. great. But you had to wear a mask in the screen, and it's just a bit like it's not pleasurable. You know? yeah. and I think that's one of the things. So there's a few things that affect that have kind of hampered the cinema. But I think they can look at the offering and like you say, right, you're, you're focused on the film creators, but then the audience, you want to make sure the audience yeah. experience. Because I think, I, no, just, I think it's a good that. thing. And a, I think it's a good thing and a bad thing, because one yes. of the things we're looking at is, um, I, I agree with what you've said to some extent. Um, what we're looking at is, and we've had some money um, to do some research and we've been able to bring somebody on board to help us with the work and the capacity of it. But we're looking at the relationship between online and in-person. And we're looking at it from the point of view commercial, how does it finance itself? Mm -hmm. We're also looking at, you know, the relationship, you know, does online kill in-person? Does in-person, what can one offer the other can't? And we, we, were, we haven't finished the, 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 the project yet, but I think one of the things that we've, um, I think we will discover is that it's not a one-way traffic. It's not online taking over what in-person can do. It's what both can do. So, you know, uh, so for example, you know, we've always had, um, you know, various requests. Can we do a retrospective of this? Can we do a focus on this? And you've only got so much time within your week to celebrate mm -hmm. new content. Well, the obvious thing might be that you put the retrospective of films from wherever or a certain director online, rights, rights permitting, obviously. Um, and that then prepares your audience for the premiere of the new piece of work with the party and the Q&A and all of that stuff. And then similarly... People who are new to the work go to the premiere because it's one of the new feature films that you're programming in that year. And you're kind of, and they're kind of going, oh, I'd love to see more from that person. Oh, by the way, it's available on the Iris website mm. or the Iris online offering. So that's just a really simple, um, straightforward 
way of using online and online. But we, you know, but we try to play around this year. So with opening night, for example, um, all of opening night was available um, online. But we'd pre-recorded all the interviews and stuff. So that was projected in the cinema. So what the cinema audience got, which was 300 strong, was what the audience at home got. But, but, the, but as a quirky thingy, just to prove that turning up to Iris was worthwhile, the presenters at the end of the show on screen, pre-recorded, one of them said, and um, for you in the cinema in Cardiff, bear with me, I'm just going to come round to see you. And then allegedly, you know, left the cinema. The presenter who was left on screen basically joked with the audience, wouldn't it be funny if you lot left before he arrived? Gave it some kind of, uh, is she there, is she not there? Yeah. The audience are not stupid. They knew it was pre-recorded. <laughs> but but the, 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 the presenter then says, and for all of you watching online, that's, that's it for tonight. Um, we've got loads more films available for you. We're coming live tomorrow. Bloody, bloody, black. Good night. And then the presenter came live into the cinema through the door, ran down the main thing, and me, whatever, whatever, and brought forward four of the filmmakers to have a little Q&A, you know, a very short mm. Q&A at the front. So that kind of gave the audience, the live audience, something extra. Different. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. and then they all left the cinema, went round the corner, and went into this big party, and um, and of course you couldn't join the party if if you weren't weren't there. So we were you know we were playing around, and I um I, I haven't got all the answers, but I am excited at what online and sharing content in different ways, which you know going back to your point right at the very beginning which is why having a relationship with Channel 4 and All 4 is the most natural thing for a film festival to do. Yeah, no, I, I think it does make perfect sense, right? You're, you're, broad, you're broadening the scope of what you do, and, and that is, man, that's immense, right? That, that's immense for you as an organization for the filmmakers and just people that enjoy stories, right? And opening up eyes and, you know, behavioral change, as I said, you know, it, it lets people see things that they might not know about, you know? There's, there, there's places even in the, the, the country that don't know certain things, right? I, I The first time I went to um, Hull was, crazy right so I, I i was seeing a girl and it was christmas time so we were like going to the supermarket to pick up stuff for her mum, right and it was like one of those westerns you know when the gunslinger walks into the saloon and everyone just stops and stares i walked into this asda and everyone just stopped and stared and some people were following me around i'm just like What's going on? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I realize, you know, albinism isn't, you know, uh, something that's all over the spot, but I kind of figured you, it's not a crazy situation here, but they didn't know, right? Yeah. They hadn't seen, and it's just like by giving people co this content right? They get to see different things that they haven't seen before. It opens up eyes and it then makes them go, oh, that was great. Wait, it's part of, what's this, Iris? Oh, it's a yeah. film festival? I, I, I need to look into them, right? And, and it, it does so much, which is incredible. So how did this relationship with Channel 4 ha happen? Because you said in the past you had one with BBC Wales, right? So what was the situation and the genesis for, you know, jumping with BBC and now coming with Channel 4? Well, Channel 4, um, from the beginning, was um, a relationship we always dreamt of having um, because it's such a strong brand that's linked to production, you know, with, um, you know, with the formation of Channel 4 in 82 and eventually the creation of Film 4. Mm. And... Um, it was just a natural thing to do, and I think um, 
you know, by the time we'd created the best British award and that had been fine tuned, and then by the time we'd had maybe five best British programs, and they were all you know of a of a standard, um, it was just making sure that we were able to meet the right people, um, and it was you know friends of friends introducing, um, and you know just making sure that they got to see stuff. And I think it was, um, you know, it, it 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 was just an obvious, an obvious thing to do, really. You know, and I think there is a logic. I think that the danger with projects is that there's an expectation you will achieve everything in the first year or two. Um, most film festivals disappear after the first year. Yeah. Um, some continue. Um, so I think that's been the genius of Ibis is that. You know, and I've learned a lot as I've got older, you know, and more experience. I've learned that we're not ready for that yet. Let's wait. Um, and, and Channel 4 w w was that, really. And um, But then the conversations became more serious. And then you went, oh, wow, this isn't a dream anymore. This is actually tangible. You could almost smell the ink to sign on the contract. Not that there was any ink involved here electronically, of course, but um, <laughs> but there, there was that sort of process. And um, I think what's been nice about Channel 4 is that, you know, we were obviously um, slightly in awe as the junior partner, mm. but, they've, um, but, but they've never made us feel like that. And um, uh, so we've become more confident as well in the relationship, and um, it's allowed us to, to, to grow. Um, it's allowed us to... Um, be more confident about what what we're able to offer the filmmakers, um, and the filmmakers, um, uh, you know, they like ourselves have realised this is the gift that keeps giving, and um, and its audiences, you know, we're just you know what was amazing um, about launch announcing year two, which we did, um, which we did a couple of weeks ago, um, was we were also able to go live with the numbers, and uh, we, we we've done more than a million. Um, with the the relationship, so because, um, half a million um, views via the all four platform, and then through the exploitation of the work on, on Channel Four, um, a, another half a million, and um, that's amazing. You know, just feeling really excited that there are people who have seen the work who probably wouldn't have seen um, anything, you know, that million um, audience is all the people who've ever been to see Iris stuff over the last 14, 15 years in, <laughs> in, in 12 months. So, um, you know, and, uh, you know, so yeah, as I said, um, for a film festival or a media organization, you know, um, the film festival continues to be important and will continue to have a very important role to play, but um, we're willing, without sounding like a tramp, we're willing to go to bed with anybody really that can help us get a big audience. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> hey, you know it makes sense, right? It, it makes sense, and um, I, I think we've seen the power of storytelling. You know, we've seen what it can do. So. Hey, the more you can spread that and get that out, you know what I mean? I think that that's the main thing. But when you signed this deal with Channel 4, were there any um, restrictions? Like, what was the deal? Like, were you, could you say, all right, we'd like to show our films on this day or at this time? Or were they like, no, this is the block we can give you? Like, how did you work all of that kind of thing out? Um, well, what we knew was that um, the more freedom Channel 4 and All 4 had, um, the more opportunities there were to do exciting things with the films. So um, the 15 films are programmed into three programs, and there's a theme. Um, so what was exciting was that when the films were shown eventually on Channel 4, and they were shown, I think there were three windows, um, LGBT History Month in February, Pride in June, and then the week running up to, to Iris. 
they were shown as those programs. So that was that was wonderful because you know although we don't curate in that their, their nominations, so we, we the, the films are there, and we just have to see if there's a theme um, or if we can see themes out to them. To have the themes play was wonderful um, because that kind of continued the the feeling of this is what you would have seen at the festival. Um, and then no, um, but but to answer your question, that was something. I actually think the Channel 4 thought that that was the natural thing to do anyway. But the films were also available as individual units. So if you wanted to see Miriam Margolis in Wings, for example, you just went straight in and, and popped in and saw that. But you could see them as, as one of the three programmes. So no, Channel 4, um, all four, more four, um, et cetera. No, they were um, unbelievably um, uh, relaxed. You know, um, we knew that there would be 15 films um, in competition. And, you know, they're not commissions. They haven't been paid for in that way. Um, so, um, no, there, there was a commitment to screen the 15. Uh, and, um, you know, there were 15 films last year. They were all part of the Iris experience on, um, on four. And imminently over this week um the end of november beginning of december we um we'll see year two and all 15 films will have the same experience so um no they've um as i said they've been i would say they made it easy because that sounds as if they haven't done anything to challenge us but um but they've been um they've you know their remit is to share um interesting um diverse stories so i think they know that we are able to um to bring these diverse stories to the table and they of course are the people who've got um the facility to um, market and then share with an even bigger audience that we could even dream of yeah no that that's great and and this year with the films and the short films, was there a theme with these ones? Or, you know, what led you to pick what's showing this year? Um, well, I think the key thing is we don't. Um, as a film festival, we're quite um, unique in that, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the international, the, the 35 films competing for the Iris Prize, we have um, uh, we have out of the 35, 25 of those films are films um, which have been nominated. So they're films um, from 25 partners in 20 countries. We don't pre-select. They tell us this is our nomination this year. So okay. Ham Hamburg, Sydney, Melbourne, um, et cetera, et cetera. They just present and um, and and that's it. There's ten spaces left, and we select. I say we we have a group of pre-selectors, and there's an open submissions process. So the other ten are from that, um, and it's very competitive. There's about four hundred films competing for ten spaces. We watch all the films, um, and the films are watched by at least two people, and then they're marked by two people. And if there's a massive discrepancy between the two marks, we have what we call the third eye. So somebody from the core team will go in and then they'll shortlist. And then all of the pre-selectors will meet with maybe five or six films that they um, want to champion. And from there, you know, they will select. And it happens every year. The top eight is easy. Always easy because ex excellence has a way of sifting up to the top yeah. or floating up to the top. It's the bottom two. And um, and that's where, you know, issues to do with diversity. We haven't seen this. Da, da, da. And it becomes slightly more difficult, but very amicably, you know, they do, um, they do, you know, reach a point. Um, so we don't program, basically. What we have done, having said that, is um, we do have uh, somebody on, on the team who will look at the 35 films who will look at the 15 British films and to try and make things easier for the audience. They'll say, well, actually, I think there's a theme here. And the theme could be something as easy as, as 
um, you know, happiness or gay films that are not sad or, or whatever they are. Um, and because, you know, in the early years, we, we, the, our imagination stretched to program one, program two, you know, you know where this is going. And we'd end up with nine programs and people were like, um, oh, what do you think about that thing? You know, the one with the massive tree in it. Where was that? Oh, I don't know. It's program one to nine somewhere, wasn't it? You know, whereas um, if if the film was, if we said this is nature and storytelling about LGBT through the love of nature or whatever it is, obviously the tree would be there. And, um, you know, and without going to, you know, marketing speak, um, programming them as a marketing tool has been very useful because we've seen audiences go up because of that. So, um, but no, we don't, we don't, um, we don't program as um, people would identify a traditional festival, which is quite liberating once you've got over the, the idea of delegating responsibility to others, just as long as they know what our priorities are and that they share our priorities. Um, it normally works quite harmoniously. Mm, yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And yeah, having, you know, strand names, I mean, that that definitely is a big help as well. Because I think I, I've, I've noticed that's what the BFI do um, and have done over the last good number of years. And then you know, hmm. Okay, the love strand. Let me go. I I enjoy that type of film, so let me look in that. And so, it, you know, what I mean, if if there's a strand that kind of speaks to you, you know where to go to find the films that you might enjoy, kind of thing. You know, yeah, what I mean? yeah. So that makes sense. That's man, that's really interesting. So tomorrow is when you've got films showing. I believe is it tomorrow. Yeah, it's very com it's very complicated in that um, you need to understand what when scheduling day starts and um, and when AM starts and is it early or is it late? Um, but basically, over this week, um, the three programs will have their terrestrial premiere on Channel Four Television, and the following day they will appear on all four. But basically, by the weekend. By the weekend, all the films will be um, available on all four to enjoy, and they're going to be there for for the next year until we uh, have another set of fifteen films, um, and they'll be the films competing for Iris twenty twenty two. Ah, terrific! And are there any films you want to kind of maybe highlight for people that like that's a must see or anything like um, that? Actually, one of the things that has happened with the growth of the festival is that my involvement with the pre-selection has, has gone completely. I'm, I'm there to monitor, so I want to make sure that all the filmmakers competing know that there is a process and that the process is fit for purpose, to use that awful phrase, and, um, and making sure that um, favours because of the festival director don't happen. Yes. Um, so I don't actually, I've, uh, last year and this year was the first year where I consciously didn't see any of the films, the short films. I programmed all the features, but I didn't see any of the short films. So I've been watching the short films after the festival, after the jury have made their decision. So um, I just wanted to make that point because it's um, there have been there have been one or two filmmakers who uh, found it very strange that I couldn't get their film through into the final. And um, <laughs> and you tried to explain to them, it's, this isn't the Bedouin Rollins Film Festival, this is the Irish Prize, of which I'm, I just happen to be the founder and the director, and um, with very little respect for that role. But, um, but I am in a position, and then but by adopting that, I can talk happily about some of the films that um, I've enjoyed. Um, so from you know what's available on, on all four by the end of the week, um, without a shadow of a doubt, the jury for international and the jury for best British um, made the right decision. It's, it doesn't happen very often that um, the best British film goes on to win the main prize as well. So um, Baba um, is... Um, 
it doesn't need any explanation. You just you should just watch it, and then you'll realise why two independent juries who did not talk to each other came to the same conclusion. The difference, obviously, was that the jury for international had more films to see from yeah. different countries, um, and Baba was seen by the British film within British films. So that is, um, without a shadow of a doubt, um, a joy to watch and to experience. And the backstory as well is interesting, which will become more apparent um, as you're watching it. I think from um, from a personal point of view, there's a beautiful animation called Cuch Dalen. And Cuch Dalen is, Cuch is the Welsh word for boat. Dalen is the Welsh word for leaf, so it's leaf boat. And Eva, who made it, she's, um, she, she's um, Welsh, living in Cardiff. And she came to the festival as a young teenager and got involved with one of our education programs and um, has gone on. And Cwch was made by um, a scheme supported by the BBC and the film agency and whatnot. And it, it's a beautiful, beautiful, vibrant, colourful depiction of friendship. And again, that is a joy to watch. Um, obviously, I've selected it because of the Welsh link, but also it's done really, really well. It got into Tribeca okay. uh, Film Festival. So I think it's one of the first, if not the first Welsh um, language, because it's in Welsh as well, mm -hmm. subtitled, so there's no need to worry about following it. But it is a visual, it's a visual thing. So it's a celebration of, and it's animation. So I'm not sure whether, you know, um, whether that is, 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 is relevant. And then my third and final, um, selection would definitely be Sam. Uh, Sam, again, you know, if, if I say too much about it, it feels it, it, it feels as if I've selected it because of the 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 issue that it deals with. But it deals with friendship, and one of the main characters is somebody who's who is Downs, and um, and it's just a fascinating because we've we've as an organisation we do quite a lot of outreach work. And in my past, from for the last four years of secondary school, we had um, a minibus of, uh, of of young people of different ages. Actually, they were just young people um, from a, a, a local um, organisation who had Downs, and we would we would spend the day or half a day or whatever. So it's quite a lot of experience with um, with, with with Downs people. And what's interesting is that is that people forget that they grow up and they are sexual beings. You know, the, the sexuality is important to them. So it's lovely to see a film um, that deals with that. I won't again. I won't say too much, but it's um, but it's been it's it's been put together um, in yeah. It, it's all I can say. It it. it it's gone down well with young people, um, and it also, um, you know, was was seen as something that people hadn't seen before. So they they would be my three. They would be my three, and all three um, all three are also entertaining. So um, that's you know, and they tell a good story. Fantastic. But there's, but there's much more available, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to be showing on Channel 4, and then they will be appearing on all four. Yes. Superb, superb. And how can people find out more about Iris and, you know, submit films or just get involved? Yeah, well, the key thing is if you want to get involved with Iris is subscribe to our newsletter. I know newsletters are like, oh my god, not another newsletter. Ours, ours is quite good in that um, it's once a month and uh, it's just got some interesting bits of news, um, and you can skirt through it because it, it's links to other stories. So if you go onto our website, which is irisprize.org, you will find there's a link there, and you can subscribe to the newsletter. So that's that's just a brilliant way of getting information um, once a month. Um, but the other thing is we, we've also are very active on social media. What a surprise. Um, so we do have a, 
depending, I guess, on your age and whatnot, but we have a very active, strong um, following on Facebook, um, Twitter. Um, I'd like to say not all of our followers are angry, um, but I do. I, I, I am a bit scared of Twitter. I call it sometimes the echo chamber of doom, but, um, but we are on Twitter. And then um, our Instagram account has become more popular. Um, with aspirational people wanting to live a happy life by sharing pictures. Um, and um, and dare I say it, we've been dabbling with TikTok, but I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how successful we were um, with that. But we're on all the social medias. But, um, but as I said, the, the, probably the best place to start um, is, with the, um, is, is with the newsletter, because obviously, as I alluded to, you know, in late January, all of February and March and some of April, we will be visiting Newcastle, Manchester, Liverpool, Plymouth, Bournemouth. And then we're going to be closer to home. We're going to be in Swansea. We're going to be in Bangor. And we've got a couple of projects taking place here in Cardiff. So we are kind of visiting and we do events in London as well. Um, so, um, yeah, we're kind of, and of course, you know, you can enjoy Iris every day of the year through um, by by visiting all four. Fantastic, fantastic! And do you have a date for Iris twenty twenty two? Yeah, we're going to be um, we're going to be roughly at the same time. So we're going to be um, in October, and we open on the uh, Tuesday, the eleventh of October. So the in person festival will be a week or so, um, and then um, at the moment um, we are going to continue then with um, Iris um, online. Fantastic. That's great, man. That's great. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. So I haven't seen any of those films yet, so I, I'm looking forward to checking That's them out brilliant. To, tomorrow. Um, because I know Emily spoke very highly of the animation, said it was just so joyful. And so, oh, it's yeah, gorgeous, yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to uh, mm. seeing that one for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for the conversation. I've... Um... It's been a, it's been a fantastic way to start uh, start the working week. So I've, I've really enjoyed. It. I wasn't quite sure um, having a chat so early on a Monday morning, um, but um, no, I've I, I've enjoyed it anyway. As I, as I, as I said, I, I like talking, and you've indulged <laughs> you've indulged my passion for opening my mouth and just talking all the time. No, no, it's been great. Yeah, you you've. Uh... Yeah, I think mean, you touched on a lot of really interesting stuff. You know, what I mean, just talking about what you're doing is, is fascinating. You know, it's definitely something I'm going to be keeping an eye on. So, hey, I really appreciate you stopping by, man. You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a good day. All right, you too, man. Thank bye you. bye. Ta ta.